So I'm going to now go through uh, the hands-on slides to have a uh, uh, to have you go through the examples here, but because I want to make sure that I've talked through how you access the burst buffer, so that if you want to try this out later on, I'll be around all day and all this evening. If you want to try this out later on, um, you know what you're doing. So this is basically uh, what your batch script is going to look like if you are uh, requesting access to the burst buffer. So this is for a scratch allocation. Uh, so this is how you request an allocation on the burst buffer for a scratch allocation. Uh, it's this pound DW, job DW um, a directive. And so here you request a specific capacity. Um, everyone is limited to 40 terabyte capacity on the burst buffer. Um, if you request more than that, then it's probably not going to work. Um, so you can request up to 40 terabytes, and then you specify your access mode, um, whether this is striped or private, um, and then you specify the type. And in this case, um, it's going to be a scratch type of instance. Um, so then you can stage in your files, and you can stage in a file or directory. Note that here you have to specify the type. So you have to specify your staging in the type of directory or type equals file. Um, and you have to specify where it's coming from and where it's going to. Um, and so note here as well, you've requested a scratch allocation. So the access um, uh, variable is pound DW job striped. Not pound DW job scratch, which I think would be more logical, but pound DW job, pound DW uh, job striped, yeah. Anyway, it's, um, this is how you uh, specify where your data goes on the burst buffer. Now, you'll notice this is an environmental variable, or at least it looks like it. You cannot use an environmental variable in the, in the source path. So you can't just say dollar scratch, whatever it is. You have to give the full path. Um, and this is uh, because uh, of the way that the Slurm uh, controller deals with uh, the environment um, for. Uh, it doesn't read all your environmental variables, um, but the Slurm controller does know the path for your burst buffer mount point. So that's something to be aware of. So you stage in your files, um, and then you can specify what you're going to stage out. And as I mentioned before, this isn't awfully um, convenient, because you have to know the name of the files or directories you're going to stage out um, before your job runs. So you do have to make sure you're writing your job appropriately so that you know where you're staging out um, your data from. And then uh, you simply oops, you simply run uh, run the job. So um, of course your job uh, your application isn't going to know where the data sits unless you tell it. And I realize most people in this room are not going to make this mistake, but we have a number of users that are confused about why their application doesn't magically know that there's a burst buffer space allocated to them. You do have to tell your application where the data is, um, but you can do that through these convenient dollar uh, DW um, paths. So. That's, um, that's the basic, basic anatomy of how you use a burst buffer. It's pretty simple. Uh, so you guys have uh, user accounts for NERSC. I don't think they'll actually expire by the end of the day. Um, but this, so this is if you want to run uh, on NERSC, then you can log in um, uh, using your training accounts. We have a reservation of Haswell nodes. So you should be able to run things pretty quickly. Um, the training, the example scripts and test data, this is all given um, on the web page that I pointed you to earlier, um, or you can just copy this off the slides. We have a training um, GitHub repository at NERSC, and there is a directory in there called ATPSC IO Day, and uh, it has some scripts in there, example scripts and intro to BB. Um, I would suggest um, that you make, uh, um, copy over this uh, one gigabyte test data file. Um, in here, because the scripts for staging um, data in assume that you have this set up, assume that you have this file. But you can obviously edit the scripts to do whatever you want, stage in whatever files you want, stage out whatever you want. Uh, this is just um, the canonical example. So um, I'm not going to go through all these in any detail, um, but you can look at the scripts. Um, there's a number of scripts. One uh, is called, uh, the names are pretty uh, straightforward. Each script does one thing, pretty much. So you have a scratch.sh um, script, which um, requests, um, it submits to the, the uh, regular um, partition. Um, you have, there are a couple of mistakes in these slides, because I didn't get around to doing screenshots of the scripts um, specific to this workshop. Um, so the reservation is not CSGF train. That was last week's workshop. Um, we have ATP SC train is the name of your reservation. 
and you want to, um, this reservation is for Haswell nodes, not KNL, so you need to make the changes I wrote there in all of these, in, in um, actually, no, sorry, you don't need to make any changes in the scripts in the GitHub repository, those should be correct, it's just in the slides that I got it wrong. Uh, and so here, um, you're simply requesting um, 200 gigabytes on the burst buffer, um, and then the job is just looking at the mount point, um, and then writing a file um, to the burst buffer and looking at it, so it's just very straightforward. Um, you submit the job using sbatch, and then you can look at the, st the status of your job using sqs and sq. Something I do want to point out is that if you use the sq-u, um, the input your username, and then dash l, that gives you the long format um, of the job information. And this tells you um, more information about what's going on with your job. And this is the command that will tell you if your burst buffer um, allocation is failed. Um, if you've done something silly, like you're trying to stage in a file that doesn't exist, this is where you'll see the error message. So my top tip for the day is sq-l. It will t show any error messages um, if you've got some problem with your, your commands. Your job will not be rejected if you try to stage in a non-existent file, but it will hang around in the queue for a long time, and you won't quite understand why. And if you lose this command, then you'll, you'll see if there's some error, some problem with it. Um, another command that is really fun to try is s control show burst. s control show burst gives you the status of the burst buffer. It tells you all the different allocations that exist on there. Um, you'll see some of these are, um, have a name that's job ID. That's people who have a scratch allocation. Um, there are some that have a name. That's for a persistent allocation. You have to name your persistent allocation. Um, and so this is kind of fun. You can see what um, people are doing. Um, with the burst buffer, how much space they have and how long they've had it for. Um, so there's um, uh, scripts to demonstrate staging data in, staging data out. Using a persistent data warp allocation, if you do this, I ask that you do get rid of this allocation, destroy it, tear it down by the end of the day. Um, by the entire, Otherwise, we have to go in there and tear down the allocation for you after your training account has expired, and that's kind of annoying. So uh, if you're going to create an allocation, you use um, a slightly different terminology. This is pound BB, create persistent, and you have to uh, specify the name. The name for the allocation has to be unique. So don't just use whatever name is in the example scripts. Make up your own name, because uh, otherwise it's just not going to work. Um, but it's same as, uh, as you might expect. You specify the capacity, of the access mode, and uh, the type. If you want to delete it, then it's simply destroy persistent. Um, is, the, is the name of the, the command. Now, something to note about creating and destroying persistent allocations, this has to be done in a slurm batch script. Um, but you don't necessarily have to do any compute in this script. So the uh, examples in the GitHub repo simply have the slurm commands in them. And this is um, a bit of a, an irritation of the way that this is set up, um, the slurm uh, and data warp integration. You have to submit a batch script in order to make a persistent reservation but it doesn't have to do anything on the compute node. So what happens is you submit the job, um, uh, you submit the job, um, and as soon as Slurm, as soon as the workload manager sees the job, as soon as it's risen to a, a point in the, in the queue that, that Slurm can look at it, it makes that reservation for you on the burst buffer. And so um, the reservation can be made well before the job actually hits the compute node, but you still have to wait for it to hit the compute node. Um, I don't, personally, I think that the job should just expire once it's done everything that was required of it in terms of creating the allocation, but that's uh, not the way that it, things are set up. But you can use S control show burst to check that if your allocation has been created. And once it is, you can use the allocation um, using uh, here pound DW, persistence DW, and then specifying the name that you gave it. So you'll note that uh, to create and destroy, you're using pound BB but to use it, you're using pound DW. So, there's a question there. Uh, I just wondered if you use the first buffer, does it change the way your job is charged at all? No, your job is charged exactly the same way, um, whether you're using the burst buffer or not, it's free. Um, it's, yeah, you're just charged for the compute time. Yeah. I'm a little bit confused about using type equals scratch on a persistent instance. Yeah, it's a terminology quirk. Yes, because type equals scratch is not what you might expect for a persistent yeah. allocation. Yep. Is the st does the staging of data count against your walk plot? 
I'm really glad you asked that question. Staging data in, staging data out does not count in your wall clock time. That's free. Um, so that's why I particularly like the staging in and out. Not only is it faster, because it's not going through the root of the compute nodes, it's going directly through the I.O. nodes. Um, you, you're not charged for that time. So you're only charged for the actual time you're doing compute. Yeah? And everything's guaranteed to be there by the time your job starts? Yes. The job, uh, so your Slurm will allocate your compute nodes um, when your job reaches a certain priority um, and uh, will mount the data warp will mount the allocation on those compute nodes. Your job will not start until all those things are done, until the data is staged in, um, the uh, mount point is set up. Your job won't start until everything is set up. So that does mean that uh, if you are doing an enormous stage in, you might find that your job is waiting in the queue longer than you might expect, because it takes a little bit of time to shove over 30 terabytes of data onto the burst buffer. Um, so you might, you sometimes see that your job's pending for longer than you'd expect. But when, once your, your um, job hits the compute nodes, everything should be there. Yeah? Uh, is the burst buffer connected to any other file system or only Lustre? Uh, burst buffer is only, um, can only access Lustre. That is something that we uh, want to change. So within your compute job, you can move data from other file systems to the burst buffer, but to stage in and stage out, we can only do this um, to and from Lustre. That's a feature that will be coming soon, I hope. Okay, so um, I'm going to leave you guys to um, look through this in your own time. Um, I also have information here about how to use a burst buffer interactively in an interactive job rather than submitting the compute job. Um, you simply put the commands, um, the burst buffer commands, in um, a con configuration file that you specify um, in your salloc. Um, and I have uh, little bits about how to, for example, running IOR. That might be a fun project if anyone wants it. Run IOR on the burst buffer, run IOR on Scratch, and run these benchmarking codes and see for yourself what kind of configuration you need to get good performance, best performance from the burst buffer. I guarantee it will be better than Lustre. Okay, so any other qu final questions? Uh, my time is up, but yes. You said the uh, our training allocation is for the Haswell nodes. Yes, that's right. Can you also get it for the KNL nodes? So the training allocation is not for KNL nodes. If you want to access the KNL nodes, then you have to take go go through the regular queue system. Your training accounts can access anything um, at NERSC. There are regular user accounts, um, but you uh, we just have an allocation a res reservation on Haswell. So if you want to access the KNL nodes, you can use a debug queue, the KNL debug queue. Um, the documentation's online. Uh, it depends on the um, queue configuration. So um, in a debug, I forget what the, the limits are, but if you search, um, do a Cori, uh, nurse Cori queue configuration search, then you'll see all the, the different limits. In a debug queue, you know, you're limited to 30 minutes and. Uh, you know, maybe 30 or so KNL nodes. If you go to the regular queue, um, then the limits are much higher. But there's a lot longer wait time to get into the regular queue. Okay, I'm going to be around for the rest of the day if uh, people have questions or want to try out some of these examples. Thanks. Thanks.